Hello and welcome to Pursuit of Perfect System. I hope you are all well, staying at home and staying safe. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a joint manufacturer event at Nintronics, the excellent hi-fi and AV dealership in Hertfordshire. The manufacturers for this event were Kef, Rel Acoustics and the Cord Company. And from this day, I was able to video and record quite a few different cool things and I'm able to turn that footage and recordings into a pretty cool video mini series. In this video, Kef's head of acoustics, Dr. Jack Oakley Brown, gives us really a history of speaker design, but obviously focusing on Kef speakers and the history and the development of the company's design process. I hope you enjoy this video as part of this little mini series. There will be lots more videos coming as always, and I've already created over 800 different videos, which you'll find in my YouTube channel. Thanks very much for watching. Stay safe. I'll see you soon. Thank you for coming to listen to me talk. I'm flattered there's so many of you actually. I'm, I'm Jack Oakley Brown, so I'm head of R&D at KEF. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through uh, a bit of a, a presentation that captures some of the history of KEF, particularly from my perspective, which is about the research and the engineering. Um, and then kind of lead through into talking about some of our technology and also a little bit about how we design our loudspeakers today. Most of you, I think, probably by the fact you came along, <laughs> have heard of KEF before, I guess. But um, KEF is, exists because of Raymond Cook. Uh, this is Raymond. Uh, I think it's probably a photo from the mid-70s. Uh, but Raymond uh, was an electrical engineer, briefly an engineer at the BBC. Um, Really, his early career was with Wolverdale. Um, he was always interested in audio, always interested in music, and as a young engineer, he started a, a, a dialogue with Gilbert Briggs uh, by letter, and they got to know each other pretty well. And then Gilbert Briggs hired him as technical director from 1955. Um, and Gilbert Briggs is quite a, a formidable character by reputation from, from that time. He was an author, he wrote, wrote a lot of books, had a lot of strong opinions on how things should be done. And uh, as a young man, I think Raymond was quite happy to work in his shadow. But things seemed to come to a head towards the end of their working relationship and they fell out. They fell out very dramatically. Uh, Gilbert was at the time writing a, a book called, um, I think it was Audio audio personalities. It was, it was about UK hi-fi scene and the important people in it. And it kind of encompassed manufacturers, enthusiasts, um, even uh, people who were recording music. And the rumour is when they fell out, Gilbert tore up the page with Raymond's entry on it. So why did they fall out? The reason they fell out was Raymond uh, in the 60s wanted to take advantage of a lot of the new technologies that were coming out. In particular, uh, uh, plastics technology was moving very quickly and rubber technology, um, and also magnets to an extent. Uh, Gilbert, towards the end of his working career at Wharfdale, um, with a very clear idea of how a speaker should be designed, wasn't interested in any of that. And, and that's really why Raymond ended up saying, thinking, I'm going to do this on my own, I'm going to set up my own company. And he founded KEF as a direct result of this in 1961. And one of the puzzles for me that I've been trying to find out a little bit more about is the ge geography. So KEF stands for Kent Engineering Foundry, and we're still based in Maidstone on the original site that Raymond set up with his business partner. But Raymond isn't from Kent, he's from Yorkshire, and Wolverdale's in Yorkshire. So a little bit of a puzzle why they ended up down in the southeast. Uh, but one of the good things about that is that it got them very close to the continental Europe and a lot of their early business was in export. The original premises was this pretty unassuming little hut on the uh, 
site of a metal working operation. And the metal opera working operation was called Kent Engineering Foundry. Uh, and the, the name stuck, I think, partly because uh, they didn't think of anything better quickly enough to put on the products. Uh, but also, the, I think it was quite convenient then for them to have a little bit of... Uh, 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 to have a, a little bit unclear where the foundry ended and where the loudspeaker business began. So it meant that they could steal some of the resources probably. But also apparently if you tried to hire somebody and you said, do you want to come and work for KEF? That meant something of a reputable company to go and work for. Uh, in the end, KEF occupied the whole site and the metalworking foundry ceased to trade. Raymond's whole motivation was to try and do things differently. Uh, he saw you know, there was lots of uh, progress in uh, materials research in, in particular. And one of the things I think is interesting, if you ever get the opportunity to come to Maidstone, give us a call. We're always happy to show people around uh, our, our museum. I meant to talk to this gentleman who's done exactly that. And you can see our uh, product history. And one of the interesting things is the early products, the very first products, they are not what you'd call a safe bet. At the time, uh, you, speakers tended to have paper cone drivers uh, with even paper cone edges. You wouldn't really even see, you'd see a few dome tweeters at that point, but not very many. But the first KEF product, these are the set of drivers that we use. It's quite a radical departure from what everyone else was doing. So it kind of all ties in with Raymond's desire to do things differently, but maybe not commercially the lowest risk thing he could have done. Um, they quite rapidly then, after the first product, which was called the K1, started to make quite small loudspeakers, and that was probably the key to KEF's early success. Um, stereo had been around for quite a while in uh, cinemas and so on, but it wasn't really uh, that widely used at home until around about the early 60s. So as soon as you ask somebody to have two speakers in their room, they probably want something a bit smaller. And Kef uh, made some very nice small, well, we would maybe not judge them as compact these days, but <laughs> some smaller loudspeakers uh, that took off. Raymond, although he was an engineer, this is his business. And now, you know, very quickly, he realized he wasn't going to be able to be the one doing all of the product development and to keep his vision of using new technology. And he managed to get the perfect man for the job, Laurie Fincham. Um, and he joined Kef in 1968 as technical director and really Laurie was the guy who kind of put Raymond's vision into practice as saying you know if we're going to uh, try and use scientific method materials how do we do that what do we need day to day and a lot of his way of doing things is still true today that's kind of the values we we try and keep pursuing so he introduced a lot of well I've listed them there but you know cooperation with universities uses of computers uh, and a lot of kind of research that you maybe wouldn't have found other loudspeaker companies doing at the time. So not necessarily looking at the product, but looking at how do you perceive sound in rooms, what should the loudspeaker do in order to perform really well. Right, right, that's right. There's a few things I'm going to dwell on a little bit longer um, because they're quite unique to KEF and computers is definitely one of the areas where KEF's had a very long history. And KEF were actually the first company to use a computer to measure a loudspeaker in 1975. So I mean obviously you'd measure loudspeakers prior to that but it would always be with analog instrumentation so you'd be uh, plotting the performance directly onto paper um, and it's um, then difficult to do things like store, compare measurements, send measurements to people, do any post-processing. So Laurie realized that if they could measure a loudspeaker digitally, then you open up a lot of possibilities of things you can do. So he actually started a dialogue with Hewlett Packard directly on, on how, how to do this. And it was in cooperation with a, a UK university. Um, I think it was university in Hull, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, and they came up with a method. He borrowed some equipment from Hewlett Packard, tested it out, got it to work, and then persuaded Raymond to spend the money. And it was a lot of money at the time. 
They bought a hardware Fourier analyzer that was it's a sixteen thousand pounds in nineteen seventy five. So if you account for inflation, that that's a very very big chunk. And um, they built a, a room, uh, which again, if you come to Maystone, you can you can see a room specifically for measuring loudspeakers using this new technique. Um, and it led to a lot of things that influence even KEF product today. So the first things they used it for were uh, actually, oh, I think I'll talk about this later on, but the production line uh, consistency. So if you couldn't digitally measure a loudspeaker, it wasn't really practical to check everything you were, you were building. So you'd have a blueprint for what the loudspeaker construction was and the production line would just get on and make it. It was very difficult to check that it was performing correctly. But once they had the digital measurement system, they could measure every single loudspeaker and compare it to what it should do. But there were also other spin-offs as well, like being able to measure drivers and then instead of assuming how the driver works when you're doing the crossover, you could do some prediction. So it's kind of the first time any kind of uh, simulation was used in, in loudspeaker design as well. It's actually through having these computer measurement systems that KEF ended up making a reference series. Um, and we hear the kind of word reference used to describe hi-fi components uh, almost ubiquitously nowadays. There's a lot of companies making a reference amplifier, a reference speaker. But we believe KEF were the first company to make a hi-fi product called reference. And the idea was that the name was describing the production method. So the production method was that every single product they made was measured and compared to a reference. And the reference was, in, in the case of KEF, it would be a laboratory prepared pair of loudspeakers that the engineers would prepare. Um, so uh, we still make it today, we've made it continuously from 1973 onwards and it's always represented the best technology that KEF has. Um, and actually this method of assuring the quality of your loudspeakers is now how it's done by everybody else in the industry too. So we don't just measure our reference series like this, we measure all of our series like this. Everything is measured and compared to, there's a, a little bit of a terminology difference. We always call it a lab standard, but some, sometimes we, uh, different places call it the, a golden sample. Uh, funnily enough, that isn't universal. There are a lot of loudspeakers uh, made and they were not measured before they're shipped. So, but KEF, everything is. This is a, a little bit out of date because it's got one of our summer interns who doesn't work for us anymore. So I'll have to update the photo. But we're still based in Maidstone. I'm head of the engineering team. Uh, this is a, a few of us. There's a couple of guys missing from this. Um, we're still based on the original site in Maidstone. From a product portfolio, we, we make quite a few products that have electronics and Wi-Fi and streaming and software. And we fit into quite a big organization where we draw in some of uh, the resources from our parent company to add specialist knowledge. But our core team here are the guys who make sure everything that has a KEF logo on sounds suitably good to have a KEF logo on. Yeah, so I mean, this team has to cover a lot of different disciplines. So I'll just talk a few about a few things that we, we have to be able to do. So obviously we need to design our drivers, we need to design our systems. Uh, mechanical design is a really big aspect of any, anything that we're going to make in our factories. We have to make sure we know how all the bits are made, how they're all going to go together. We often have to do prototyping as well. So this is maybe recognizable as <laughs> one of the very early test mules for the Blade project. Uh, you can theorize about what you think will work um, in terms of you know, something that will sound really good, but you, you firstly have to prove it, but then you also have to normally demonstrate it to other people. So we do a lot of prototyping work. Sometimes you prototype something and it disappoints you. Sometimes you do something and it's much better than you expected as well. Computer simulation is massive for us, really big. Uh, since you know, we got into computers with the measurement side early on, that's pretty much steadily continued. Um, we're one of the leading companies in uh, using computers to design loudspeakers. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a bit more about that as well. 
But you also get some other things that come with simulation that you have to do. If you, if you don't do them, then the simulation is pretty meaningless. So you have to be able to measure things extremely accurately. You have to be able to characterize the materials very well that you're using in your products. Uh, if your simulations don't match the real behavior, you might as well not bother doing them. Uh, we also have a lot of products now that days which have DSP. So basically, we take the signal coming into the speaker and we can use a little computer to ma manipulate it uh, before we send it to the driver. So we have experts as well on site who work on how uh, we should process the sound to make the speaker sound better. On the computer simulation side, we actually develop a lot of software ourselves to do this. So there's a lot of software available nowadays uh, commercially that you can use to do different types of simulation. So you could you know, have a look at fluid flow, for example, or magnetics, individual domains. But in terms of loudspeakers, nobody's making a package which is just suitable for loudspeakers. And loudspeakers are kind of unique because they have a lot of different physical domains in them. So if you think about uh, that pair of loudspeakers, we've got obviously the signal coming from the amplifier, so it's an electrical signal. It's going to then go through some electrical circuits, goes into a motor system which has a magnetic circuit in there. Uh, we then generate cone movements, that's vibration. And then finally that generates sound, which is acoustic. So, uh, oh, and of course when you drive it hard, things can heat up as well. So you've got a lot of different physical domains going on here. And our strategy you know, from quite early on was to build our own tools so that we could look at things in that exactly the way that we needed to put them in the right context for a speaker. Um, so that's a big part of what we do as well. So some examples of why you might want to do computer simulation. So uh, this is a tweeter. It's a computer model of a tweeter. Often with simulation, you're up against computational time. Uh, anything you can do to speed up the analysis helps you make more progress in, in your engineering, but you have to be careful not to make it too simple, in which case it won't represent the real thing. So what you can see here is, I always call it a cake slice. <laughs> I think it's obvious to everybody what that means, but a little slice that if you mirror it around, it makes a whole geometry. So that's just a way that we can speed up the model. Uh, and on this particular tweeter, we've got a few parts. So we've got the aluminium, which is the front green part here. Uh, there's another aluminium part behind, which joins the dome to the voice coil. And then a little flexible surround here. So the idea of the surround is it flexes so that the dome can move, but it also stops the dome from moving out of the gap too far or from moving sideways. I think you've all seen tweeters and you never see them move, <coughs> right? Because they move so little. So one of the reasons you might want to do a computer simulation is just so you can visualize what's going on. But I guess if I asked you to have a, have a stab at what a tweeter was doing when it was working, that's probably what you'd reckon it was doing, right? So if we're asking the tweeter to move very, very quickly, then you get some things that are extremely hard to predict. So this is now 45,000 hertz. So what that means is we're moving it backwards and forwards 40, 45,000 times every second. So it's extremely fast acceleration. So changing direction, if I shook you that quickly, you, you might do something like this. And this is the point where trying to do it by calculations on a piece of paper falls apart. You really need to use a computer model to predict this kind of behavior. So does this really happen? Yes. Does it happen at this amplitude? No. We've, we've magnified it so that we can see it clearly. But that is what happens. Some bits are moving towards you. Some bits are moving further away. And this is useful because once the tweet is doing this, it won't sound very good. So we can straight away use the computer model to say, well, where is it working? Where isn't it working? And we can change things. We could change the size. We could change the materials. We could rerun it, see if we've improved the performance or not. Drivers were really the thing that Kef started to focus on when we first looked at 
simulation. But these days, uh, computers are a lot quicker. We can look at the behavior of bigger structures. And we're focusing a lot on refining the details. So cabinets move an awful lot if you're not careful about controlling them, about bracing them. And this is a little, little example of that. So you can see on the left here, this is maybe a very traditional box construction. So it's 18 millimeter thick MDF. It's pretty much ubiquitously used across the industry. And you can see it's got a base driver in here. And this is all to scale. So what's happening here is at this frequency, there's a resonance in the cabinet. And what you see is the front and the back moving apart like this. And if you look at how far the cone's moving, it's pretty similar to how far the box is moving. And at this frequency, there's more sound coming from the cabinet than there is from the, the driver. So that's not great. And the, and the problem with that is it only happens at this frequency. So it's, when you listen to it, it's something which is very, very colored. It's got a very, very strong characteristic to it. And that's not what we want, <laughs> obviously. I mean, you can think about the whole cabinet design as, as trying to make everything silent, really. We're designing the drivers to make the sound that we want you to hear, and we don't want anything else to make sound. And we can use computer simulation to improve the cabinet as well. So this is, as I say, a very traditional box configuration. But if we add bracing, uh, I should say, well, this is obviously a half of a cabinet, but this is a quarter. Um, we can simplify things slightly differently if they're if they have different symmetries. So this was the starting point for the LS50 cabinet, actually. And this is the final, the final version. So how does it, you can see the cone moving still. You actually can't see the walls moving. But that's because they're not moving. It's not because I've stopped them from moving on the computer. So how did we get from there to there? Well, by putting bracing in exactly the right place and also putting damping in exactly the right place. So it's still using traditional materials, MDFs, uh, some damping, which isn't so traditional, and on the LS50, uh, a special curved baffle, which is very stiff. Uh, so uh, that was one of the key things with the LS50 is not just adding stiffness with bracing, it's adding damping too. So you reduce, reduce the excitation of the, the cabinet resonances. So there's another important way that the cabinet affects the sound you hear. I mean, when we're listening to anything, our brain's extremely good at working out where the sound is coming from. Uh, that's a, an evolved trait that we have so that we can spot predators. It's very handy, you know, if you hear a bus coming as well. <laughs> but sound, when it arrives at your ears, if you analyze it, we've got lots of reflections, lots of uh, other sounds coming because of scattering off objects and things. And when you look at sound, it's not like a laser beam like a ray of light, it's much more like waves that you see on a pool of water. So it clings to surfaces. So if we make a sound from the tweeter here, it travels out towards the listener, but also clings to the box. And what you see in the response at the front is that if you have some feature that trips the sound, you get an irregularity which is radiated out to the listener as well. So we want to be able to analyze that as well, design the shape of the cabinets to make sure what you're hearing is as, as clean as we can possibly make it. A little bit of a less obvious one, ports. You get very high velocities in ports. And on the, the left here, this is a very simple loudspeaker port, which is just a straight tube. And what you can see is we quite quickly develop vortices here and turbulence like this always causes noise. And it's actually very disturbing because it, it's not harmonic at all. It, it is like noise, so you can normally hear it very easily. When you have a problem that creates harmonics, sometimes it's a little bit harder to hear because you've got all the harmonics of the instruments. If you have something like noise, it's very easy to hear. Uh, and in this case, if you get the port shaped just the right, you can really avoid almost all of that turbulence. So another area. Where, where you can use computer models to improve things. That's why we're using this approach, because you can look into the physics of the situation very well. You can see things that are quite difficult to observe if you have just the prototypes. But also then you can use the computer models to improve the behavior. We've still got to decide what we're trying to do with all of this. 
And really we have a very clear goal with a Kef loudspeaker that more or less comes straight from Raymond. He was very clear about what he was trying to do uh, with Kef and what he thought a loudspeaker should do. And there is a wonderful quote that he, he's far more erudite than I am and it, it really outlines this very nicely. Um, but really we don't want to do anything to the music you're trying to enjoy. That's what the whole, the whole experience is about. It's about the music, not about the speaker showing off. And we really boil this down into these three aims here. So we're not trying to exaggerate anything. We're not trying to add any musicality or coloration. The speaker isn't a musical instrument. It should, shouldn't get in the way. And the last one's a little bit more tricky, but we're trying to do it in, in a very natural way. And really, what that comes down to is not distracting you, not doing something that's a bit strange that breaks the illusion that the orchestra's in front of you or the singer's in front of you. And this is the same approach that we use for everything we do. So when you listen to uh, a Kef blade, you get the same kind of traits coming through as if you listen to uh, a Q150, for example. <laughs> make a link really between those aims and how we're going to achieve them in terms of you know what does the speaker have to do so I have to understand a little bit how you hear sound so this probably is familiar to quite a few people in this room but one way that you can characterize what you can hear is by pitch so we're all familiar with music and we have low frequencies or low notes in music mid high and very high treble, things that don't really sound like tones anymore, but they're little details at the top end. Technically, we can think about that as frequency. So how many times is something repeating every second? And the thing that's interesting about that is if you look at it like that, it's a very, very wide range. And that makes it quite tricky to make a speaker that's very convincing. So this is a very crude diagram from the internet. <laughs> but it kind of matches up pitch with frequency and frequency 20 times a second so actually very slowly kind of slower than your car revs up to 20,000 times a second so it's a very 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 large range of frequency that we need our speakers to produce so another way of analyzing what you can hear is to look at how loud it is and again this is probably terminology you're familiar with to an extent already um, so Loudness, as you perceive it, we can more or less match that up with the amplitude of the sound. And we measure the amplitude of sound in decibels. Uh, you don't have to measure the amplitude in decibels. You can measure it in PSI, if you like, because it's air pressure. That's what you're actually hearing, is changes in the air pressure. So PSI or Pascals or atmospheres, whatever you pump your tires up with, you, you can measure it in that. So why don't we? Well, the reason we don't is because the range is very large and it's quite inconvenient to use Pascal. So it's actually a, a ratio of one to 3,000. So it's an incredible range of amplitudes you can hear as well. Uh, decibels gets that 3,000 ratio down into a nice, it's not quite Celsius, zero to 100, but it's not far off. Zero being, you can hear it if you're in a, dead quiet room and you've got really good hearing <laughs> up to the point where you know you actually have to go and leave the area it's so loud it's hurting your ears so it's a nice scale for us to use uh, because it makes it very manageable so the third thing to consider about how we're here is that we're not in environments that don't have an acoustic signature or rather I should say we're always in an environment that has an acoustic signature so what we think we're hearing is this. What we're actually hearing is this. Your brain's great at this. It's remarkably good. So if you analyze from the speaker to the chair, all of the sound that's reaching your ears, there's hundreds of paths of sound. But when you're perceiving it, you just think, I'm hearing 
Jack speak or I'm hearing the speaker. Your brain's very good at recognising, oh, that's a reflection, it was the same event I just heard and lumping it all together. But it has a big implication for us when we're designing the speaker. Because if you make a speaker that's the best in the world at directing sound directly to somebody, but is terrible in other directions, it's not going to cut it. These other directions will reach the ears of the listener, a reflection off the side walls, the ceiling, the floor. So we have to make sure the speaker behaves really well in a whole range of directions. So with a bit of understanding about how you hear th things and what we want to do, we can then say, okay, this is basically how we should try and design our products. So I won't go through the very details, but it's, you know, that is the whole range of your hearing ability. We're trying to cover all of it when we design a product like the Blade. So we're doing it really with a relatively crude approach, right? We create sound by moving the air and we're moving the air with physically. The cones are moving in and out. Um, and in a speaker drive is, for me, quite a fascinating thing because in principle it's very simple. But to design a good one is really, really challenging. Um, and I was saying earlier on to this gentleman here, you know, if you look at the speaker drivers uh, that were built in the 1930s and you just look at the parts, it's not that different from what we make now, but the performance is way different. And the details are the thing that's, that matter. What materials are you using? What's the shape of everything? And how do all the parts interact? But the drivers on their own don't produce good sound. You need the enclosure. And the reason for that is that we can move air with the diaphragm, but we're always going to move air at the back at the same time. So if the diaphragm is moving forwards, it's creating positive pressure on the front, but it's creating negative pressure on the back. And if we don't do anything about it, all you get is more or less like a fan. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sound, it just moves a lot of air from the front to the back. And the enclosure is actually part of the deal here to make a full sound. We have to capture that rear sound so that we can create an effective wave at the front that's going to reach the listener. And that leads to the next thing, which is you then get a direct relationship between how big the enclosure is and how much bass you get. And this is, this is pretty fundamental. So if we have a very small enclosure to trap that rear sound, then it's very hard for the cone to move because every time it moves, it has to compress this rear volume. And if we want to get deeper sound, we have to make that enclosure bigger. And this is something you see time and time again in acoustics as a relationship between pitch and size. And actually, we're fundamentally all familiar with that anyway. So if I showed you two bells, one this big, <laughs> one this big, and I said, which one's got the lower tone? You know, don't you? You all know. So you see it time and time again. There's this fundamental relationship between size and pitch. Uh, so I've got an example of uh, stringed instruments, but it could be any instrument, horns, it could be pipe organs, you name it. And, and we know this one goes deeper. And that's why you have this relationship in loudspeakers where there's nothing like a big floor standard for producing deep bass. <laughs> Something we'd love to be able to break, but it's very difficult to get around it. <laughs>
Let's say we designed a woofer that's really great at bass and up to kind of the lower vocal range, and then we've got a tweeter to do the rest. We split up the sound that's come in and we're sending it to these two drivers. How do we sum it back together? Well, we kind of don't really. We just have them there on the product. We allow the sound just to come from each of them. And what you hear is just however they've added up in the air as they've traveled towards you. So why does that matter? Well, what you can see here is that that creates something where the sound changes depending on where you are. So in this case, I've put a little pulse into the speaker. And the tweet is producing part of it, and the woof is producing part of it. And if I'm directly in front, it actually is quite good. I get the pulse at my listening position, say, here. So this, this is pretty good, this pulse here. But what you can see is if you're around here, then now I'm closer to the woofer, and I'm further, further away from the tweeter. So you can see there's the tweeter, there's the woofer. Whereas if I'm here, don't wait for it to come back. <laughs> we get the tweeter first. So there's the tweeter there, and there's the woofer afterwards. So if you think about if you're moving around the room, if you're listening in different positions, but also you have to remember what you're hearing isn't just the sound coming directly at you, it's also the reflections. So Kef wanted to have a solution for this. And in 1988, uh, it's actually Laurie Fincham on the patent for it that invented the UniQ driver. So UniQ is now in all of our products, all of our Hi-Fi products. What does it mean? Well, instead of putting these two drivers in different places, we try and put them so that they work together and you can't tell there's two drivers there. So the tweeter is in the very middle of the bass driver. And this is the first UniQ, the C35. Um, so when you do that, then you don't have this problem. So irrespective of where I am, I'm always the same distance from the tweeter as I am from the woofer. And if I can get good, a good response anywhere, sorry, a good response in one place, it'll be good everywhere. That's, that's why they were motivated to do it. And the, ti the timing of UniQ is quite significant because I, the idea of a single source of sound or putting two drivers into one isn't brand new. There are, for example, companies like Tannoy who've been making a driver uh, that tries to do this for a long time. But in 1988, <coughs> magnet technology changed dramatically with neodymium magnets, which are rare, very, very strong, small magnets. And that's why UniQ was invented then, because it wasn't possible to make the tweeter small enough before you had these very powerful magnets. So that was 1988. And the first UniQs were relatively quite simple. Take a bass driver we already have, put a tweeter in the middle of it. There's a lot that goes on when you do that. The interaction between the two drivers, uh, the way you have to design the mid-range to get the tweeter to work is quite different. And, and so if you look at a UniQ we make today, just from looking at it, you can see it's quite different from the early days. And we've spent, a, you know, probably, well, it is the best part of 30 years trying to really improve UniQ to make it as good as it possibly can be. One of the things that's really important is that the behavior of a tweeter when it's on the front of a box is very different from when it's in a shallow waveguide like this. And one of the keys with the UniKeys we make now is that we're very careful about the shape of the dome and the shape of the mid-range so that the response of the tweeter is really good. So, this is actually the optimized shape on the right um, compared to a normal dome. And, and you can see we can get something with computer simulation and computer optimization where you can get a very, very clean sound from the tweeter, even though it's in the middle of the mid-range driver. One of the things, one of the problems that causes is that you don't then have much choice about what shape the dome's going to be. It's got to be that shape to give the right acoustic performance. Uh, but the dome, as we saw from the animations earlier on, it bends and we need to have some control over its breakup when it resonates. So most of our tweeters use a, a bit of a more complex geometry than you'll see in other brands. So at the edge of the dome, which have two layers of aluminium with a triangle between them, 
So it creates a very stiff edge to the dome. And our domes are rigid up to about 40 kilohertz. So, I mean, you commonly would estimate audio between 20 and 20k. There's some debate above the upper limit, but we want to be well above that so that you definitely can't hear any trace of our dome breaking up. And mo most aluminium tweeters that are one inch uh, will be well, well short of 40 kilohertz. Another thing you'll see on our mid-range drivers that are in two-way systems is a very distinctive surround. So actually on, on the cone driver, that's predominantly for the tweeter performance. One of the things that the early UniQ suffered from was reflections from the edge of the cone driver. So even if you get a very, very nice tweeter, if it then reflects off the outside edge of the mid-range, you can get something at the listening position which is quite confused. So when you see LS50 or Q350, you'll see a very smooth profile. Uh, another very distinctive feature of the UniQ is the Tangerine Waveguide, which is this part on the front here. Um, this is a little bit of add-on technology from our group, really. So we mentioned Gold Peak earlier on. So there's another company called Celestian in the Gold Peak group. And a lot of our engineering resources are shared, so the software is shared, but some of the technology as well. And there's a piece of shared technology on uh, face plugs, so how to control the sound coming from domes so that you can get a better response when they're on horns. So Celestian used this for big PA systems to, to operate at live gigs and things like that. It goes loud as possible. But we use the same technology to improve how that sound's launched into the cone driver. So alongside that, we've talked a lot about the tweeter, but it's also very important to have a mid-range which performs really well. And the mid-range is challenging in a different way. With a, with a tweeter, we can make something that's very, very stiff and light and doesn't have much damping. Because if it has a resonance that's above the audio frequency, if we can get it far enough, you can't hear it. But with a mid-range, like the cabinet, we're never going to be able to do that. So if we take this red curve here. This is from a, a four inch driver um, in aluminium. So we'd only use this up to about two and a half kilohertz. But if we have a really big severe breakup like this, it's very difficult to make a crossover where you won't be able to hear that. And one of the key things for us is we really want the drivers to move rigidly. So just backwards and forwards without bending, because we believe that gives the best fidelity. But if you just have stiffness, then you can get a very sharp character on the cone. And we use a, a special technology where we damp the cone at the neck. Uh, and you can see once you add the damping, you can get rid of the peak very effectively. This is a more, a more recent one. Uh, we're still trying to improve UniQ. There's still things that we can do to make it better. But we're getting definitely down to some of the more subtle details. So, one of the things with the UniQ is that there's a gap around the tweeter. And we do get a little bit of the sound going down that gap and bouncing back out. So for the new R series, which is R3, R5, R7, we added uh, an acoustic absorber down there as well to capture that sound and improve the performance a little bit. So in, in summary, you know, UniQ now is not the same really as UniQ when it first came out. We've got yeah, 30 years of continuous improvements. We use actually kind of generations to measure different UniQs by their features. And the original UniQ was actually patented, but the patent only lasts 20 years, so we're 10 years out of date. But we have five other different patents on exactly how we make a UniQ work. So you'll see some other manufacturers with similar drivers, but they're missing 20 years worth of technology updates. Um, and this is a bit technical, I was trying not to put in too many graphs, but it gives you an idea of how we look at things. So this is frequency, which is more or less like pitch, and this is SPL, which is more about how loud it is. And really we want the speaker to be very, very even, but we don't just look at what the speaker does directly to you. We do, of course, that's the red. So very, very flat and even to you, but we also want to capture what it does in the other directions. So there's lots of different possibilities, so I've put several of them there. So we can look at what 
The sound is over a, a, a little window where you might be sitting on a sofa, which is the blue curve. We can look at the sound coming from the whole front hemisphere of the speaker, which is the green curve. Or we can look at how much power, acoustic power, we're putting to the room, which is the purple. And we believe the key is actually to make sure all of these are good. So we don't look at one of them and see, or oh, suddenly we don't have any treble, or suddenly there's a dip or a peak. If you want the speaker to be uncoloured and you want it to work in a normal room, it's got to be really good in all directions. And that's something that's quite unique to KEF. Listening is very important to inform what we're doing on the engineering side. So I've talked a lot about our aims. Now all of those aims are informed by listening. So by doing experiments and having evaluations, uh, by changing things and listening to their effect. And all of our products are ultimately balanced by ear. We do it with a listening panel. We don't do it with uh, a golden ear person. Because one thing I feel quite strongly about is everybody's got different things they listen out for. And if you just have a single person deciding what the product should sound like, then you end up with something that can be quite polarizing. It can really suit one style of presentation or it can suit somebody's preferences. And I'm quite su continually surprised if I listen with my colleagues and we listen to something, afterwards you kind of get their assessment and you'll find half of the things you agree with them on and half of the things you wouldn't even have noticed. They're, they're listening out for different things to you. So we try and get a consensus in how our product sounds so that we make something that can appeal to everybody, can work on all different types of music. And what we try and do is also, it's also extremely difficult not to have some kind of uh, a bias about things when you're listening to them. And it's especially difficult if you have some involvement in the development. So again, what we try and do is get blind tests from the guys who aren't developing the product. So more or less, as a summary, I mean, I feel quite a strong link to Raymond's original idea and what we're trying to do. So really his original reason for founding KEF, we're trying to keep that going, trying to use materials and engineering to make the products sound better. Um, still done in Maystone, nice little team of guys. And uh, yeah, we enjoy doing it and it's always great as well to hear uh, people who own our stuff and are enjoying using it. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Any questions?